The uh, farmer that called me and said they need a, a tractor transported over there. Looks like the train stalled. So you might have to take the back route. Going with my gut on the uh, the summers around the campfire, telling scary stories and running around with all my cousins. Yay! Imagine a large capital T for a road above the T by Oh, I want to show you guys something. If you went left on the T, I just downloaded this mod and look, so front. Uh, it's either the front loader tool, I think it's the front loader tool, so you can do this with the TTHT flatbed, and then put, put the, uh, the lift front loader tool all the way down, and then floor it. Alright, and then the front loader tool, you can... <laughs> Pick this up. Admitting she'd come with me so she could smoke a joint and keep out of eyesight of my disapproving grandmother. Now, I was a good kid, and even though she offered me a hit, the thought of drugs still scared me, so I declined. From the end of the road was a super rough dirt path into the woods, with the river still running 150 feet above the path. If you were to walk towards the river, it All right, goes on so. the slope. The farmer lives right around the, uh, I think it's right up this mountain, actually. Oh, crap, uh, the government didn't see that, uh, totally didn't knock over one of their signs. Holy crap. And this dude, how does this dude get the harvester down and up? He doesn't have a harvester, he's out harvesting right now, I think. So I'm going to uh, unfold the trailer, put the uh, put that down, then I'm going to detach, oh crap that might be a little, Alright, I'm gonna go up. I'm gonna go open the tractor because I can't get my tractor and trailer up. Holy crap! I don't think this dude is a farmer. He probably owns the castle. All right, I'm just going to put this thing right here. Put that right there, that should be good. 
Then I'm going to go back to my uh the river is really deep in parts, but where I had been, we were at a point where the water to my truck and then we're gonna fold the trailer back up. I'm gonna see if I can get up here so I can turn around. When we saw the stairs, my aunt quickly yanked to me to the other side and slid down the side crap. I was wheezing so loud I had to cover my mouth to try to muffle the sound. I peer around, but the trees are so dense I can't see the river from the stairs, but even with my hammering heartbeat, I hear you snapping at branches like someone barreling through the forest. Now, I am very, very scared. It's not an easy straight trail back. There we are. You have to weave around it in spots. It dips and gets rocky, so you have to do about an S-shape to get through. There's random rocks everywhere, and it would be easy to... Alright, yeah, we need to go through the back way again, because the, uh... Look where we were going, because there's so many snakes in that area. I'm sobbing and badly. We but the train is still stalled. They probably hasn't, haven't gotten a hold of the mechanics to that one. So, I need to go back around it. ...weapon, and staying here was making it harder for me to convince myself to run, as... Paralyzing terror crept in. My legs and arms are already cut up, and before I can decide what to do, my aunt pulls me towards the T road, desperately, just stumbling and running. I don't make it more than another mile until I misstep and trip over a branch, tripping and cracking headfirst into a tree. Uh. I crumple over and taste blood. I bit through my lip in the fall. I'm dazed, but my adrenaline is still pumping, so. I scramble to a tree as my aunt turns. Oh my god. Not right behind her. She scrambles back and drops to her knees in front of me, whispering. I'm dazed, but she keeps repeating that we need to keep going. I'm shaking so bad I don't think I can walk, much less run. I have probably another mile and a half until I'm on my family's property, but another two until we're at an occupied cabin, my grandmother's. My ears are ringing, and I'm hardly paying attention to my aunt's Oh, crap. Leaves. I don't think this I is the way myself out again and keep looking that behind we me, but can. I don't see anything. She decides that she's not going to waste any more time because of stupid me and half drags me up and forward. I hobble forward as quick as I can as she continues to pull me too quickly. The rest is a blur until we break through the woods. Most of my family wasn't there at the time, so... We only stop when we make it to my grandmother's, and I just run in sobbing. No crap. Locks their doors around me. My grandma takes one horrified look at me and my aunt, who is equally cut up and scared looking, and yells for my grandfather, who promptly takes over and grabs his rifle. I can't put into sentences what just happened to my aunt taking over, leaving out the part about her being high as a kite. He and my grandmother go cabin to cabin, Gathering the men and their guns, as well as warning the women and children about what had just occurred. All right. There's no signal up there, so calling the sheriff really wasn't an option. And to get up to the mountain, if they left immediately, would take over an hour. It's getting dark. The roads leading up to the property are so windy and steep, you'd have to be out of your mind to try to drive up them in the dark anyway. My mother eventually got word and came over. She took one look at my aunt and said that I'd probably just gotten high with her, yep. which oh, right. made us overly paranoid, and when we saw the random fisherman who was trespassing, we jumped to conclusions and had probably startled him as much as he had startled us. She continued by saying I probably just imagined he was taking my picture or that he began chasing us, though my aunt had been the one to repeatedly retell the story. My aunt stood up and yelled at my mother, saying that I was a good kid and didn't do anything that we were telling the truth. They began right. screaming at each other, and my grandmother made them both stop, telling them both to grow up. Even with the men of my family scouring the woods, they never saw any sign of the man that we had encountered there. Everyone on the mountain locked their doors that night, though, for the first time in a long time. And to this day, all I can wonder is if I am part of some creepy picture collection. Right. Considering what could have happened, Maybe if I had been alone like normal, I can live with that. So, I'm going to wait for another call. This was 1998 when this happened. 
I think we'll just uh, drive around for a while. Without the trailer, of course. I was excited all week leading up to the trip. I didn't get much sleep the night before because of it. And he picked me up just after 5 a.m. and right. we drove the hundred miles to the park. I managed to get a little bit of sleep, so I felt a little better when we arrived. Then he dropped the bomb on me. We still had to walk another two hours to the campsite. I tried to talk him into choosing one a little closer, but he swore I'd love it when we made it. Now, with a heavy heart, I followed him. The first half hour wasn't that bad. Most of it was all downhill. However, as more time passed, I became what sluggish. What is this? Halfway there, we took a short break, but we're back on the trail before I knew it. The second leg was a lot more uphill. Oh, this is cool. It wasn't cool. long until I was dragging again and not paying attention to where I was going. We arrived at a flat section, and I was relieved. My friend was in front and somehow missed the trap, but I didn't. All I remember was that one second, I was clomping along and hitting the ground the next. The prison was so the long. The hold jolted me awake, and the rush of adrenaline masked most of the pain. As I stood up, my right leg buckled, and I dropped down and the sharp stick so jutting out below me. Apparently there were several more stakes in the bottom of the hole, but they had been knocked over, thankfully. When I looked down, I saw the bone sticking out of my shin. Instinctively, I pulled the stick from my leg, and pain made me even queasier than I already was. All right. I looked up to get an idea of where I was, pick up and some I saw the sky edged by trees. I figured the hole was about to catch So I can, uh... I must have taken the idiots that dug it several days. I yelled up for my friend only to see his laughing face greet me over the edge. He didn't know the extent of my injuries at that moment. But so I'm going I to uh, go pick up the trailer, then I'm going to bring the uh, stuff over here. Happened, and he told me it looked like some redneck poachers had dug some type of bear trap and I'd fallen into it. I assumed he could simply reach down and pull me out, but that didn't work. So next, he attempted to reach me with a tree limb. This worked, at first. But when I tried to stand up, the pain was far too severe. I couldn't put any weight on my right leg. It was obvious I wasn't getting out of the hole without some outside help. It was still early in the day, so I wasn't very concerned. I could hear my friend pacing around above me and freaking out. So I called up to him in a calm voice and told him to go get help. The ranger station was only a little over an hour back from where we came. Right, he could easily okay. get help and make it back to me with plenty of time before dark. Once he took off, I was left alone with nothing but the pain to occupy me. By now, it was coming in waves, and the accompanying nausea wasn't making it any better. Initially, I thought I could make a splint, but the moment I tried to tighten it down, I almost fainted. Leaving it alone seemed the wise decision. I put my head between my knees and waited for the sick, dizzy feeling to pass. Eventually, it did, and I tried to focus on other things. Singing worked for a while. Right. That is, until I started hearing thunder and noticed the sky above me getting darker by the minute. Getting a little wet wasn't going to kill me, right? Perhaps I should have considered my circumstances before saying that. The rain was relatively light at first, but within minutes, it was coming down in sheets. I was okay, until I began to notice the hole filling with water. My feet were already submerged by the time I realized I was in trouble. I clawed my way up the wall until I was standing, at least the best I was able, and started praying for it to stop. As the minutes passed, more of my body disappeared. After an hour, the storm began letting up, and I could relax. The water level was only about halfway up to my shins, and... I knew now, if it continued at that rate, help would be here before it even reached my waist. Unfortunately, it was just a lull in the storm. Soon enough, the rain was sheeting down again. The only positive thing about it all was it had taken my mind off the pain in my leg. I tried to be upbeat, thinking back on funny jokes and movies. The next hour was the longest of my life. When help finally arrived, the rain had almost completely stopped. At the time, the ropes pulled me out, 
The water was just below my belt. Wow. Thinking about drowning to death in a little hole out in the middle of nowhere still gives me the willies. Once I was out of the hole, the ride to the hospital went by pretty fast. After a surgery where I acquired some screws and a few plates, I was allowed to go home. The next eight weeks on crutches would drag by, but I was happy to be alive. Broken leg or not. Oh, that is cool. We never got to make up for the lost trip. Maybe, maybe this is the person that made Prism in Solo's house. A year since. Well, it's on my mind. You get a good view of the pier from here. We That's haven't nice. seen one another in a few years, and a camping trip may be right. the best way to catch up. I'll just be sure to keep my eyes open. Now I shall this drive way. off of it. My life growing up was far from good. Rather than constant physical abuse, although there was that too, my parents ignored me most of the time. There. Both had drinking problems. My mom only worked part time, so she could, as she said, be there for her kid. But she really spent the majority of her free time in a bottle or bed. My dad was the main breadwinner, working as a over the road truck driver. He was away most of the time, leaving me alone to take care of myself. Our apartment was on the edge of town, surrounded by miles of forest. As long as I can remember, I was entranced by those woods. Mm -hmm, it wasn't long before I was spending my days exploring them. My love. I'm gonna try to. Uh... I soon realized neither of my parents were paying attention to my comings and goings, so I began camping out in the woods overnight, here and there, just to see if I'd be missed. But as I figured, I wasn't. From there, I began I'm spending go weeks of time with... camping throughout the vast forest. Over here. We all know. All good things must end, and one morning, I was caught walking out of the woods by my father. he just arrived back from time on the road. It was early, and he was livid to see his 12-year-old son walk out of the woods at 5 a.m. on a school day. In addition to tanning my hide, I got an earful from them both. This didn't stop me from returning, though. After laying low around home for a week, I waited for my dad to leave and my mom to drink. When I was sure she was asleep, I fled back to my real home. I would slip back early every morning prior to school without anyone noticing. It didn't take long for things to go back to the way they had been before. If I wasn't at school, I was out roaming the woods. I mentioned before I had a series of camps throughout the forest. Early on, I realized I was sharing my getaway with others. Among these interlopers were small groups of homeless people. <laughs> They'd use the woods as a place to camp and drink, away from the prying eyes of the police and public. I made the mistake of staying in the same place too long on one occasion and almost got assaulted because of it. After that run-in, I moved my camps to the other side of the river. Some nights I would lurk in the shadows and watch them destroy themselves with drugs and drink. Many times, violence would break out, and this only reinforced my hate for them. I already saw enough of that at home, anyway. As the months passed, I moved deeper into the vast forest, always looking for a new place to explore. My God, I'm by me, uh... More homeless. It wasn't long before they had their filthy little camps all over the woods. However, at that point, I was still safe if I stayed on my side. I was the only person who knew where to cross. River or not, my paradise would be taken away from me once and for all by these very same people. One hot summer afternoon, I was down on the banks getting water. I'd heard voices off in the distance, so was keeping my eyes peeled. I'd retrieved my water and was returning back to my camp when I heard a group of people arguing on the opposite side. Curious, I hid and watched. There was a raggedy tent set up and next to it... will be back in this isn't clean, much Evan. Said. Your room is not clean. They looked like they were drunk, swaying around while they argued. Okay. I stayed around for about know. ten minutes when too. one of the men hit another. You know, you got, head, you got wires, wires, you got, the you know, the dustpan, the, dust the, pan, the screwdriver. I waited Come for the on, man. To move, but okay. he didn't. Dude. The assailant then picked up a big rock and threw it down on the man okay. while the others just Don't stood by and watched. Right. He did this over and over, about three times. Alright, guys, I'll be AFK for a I had to stifle a scream as I watched this horror unfold, and by now I was too scared to move. 
Huh? I was talking to her. Uh, I was broadcasting. I just said, I'm just gonna be AFK for a second. After a minute of doing this, the others yelled something again at him. Hey, can y'all turn that down a little bit? You need me to turn right down a little bit too, Dad.
trapped inside a rundown apartment in New Jersey. And without Mac's love, understanding, and teaching, none of it would have ever happened. I'm sure this is more than eight miles an hour. So I called out again. 
The rustling repeated, followed by another moan. I ran in that direction about twenty yards and stopped. The rustling came again, just to my right and very close. I couldn't see anything, so I dropped my stomach and scanned the ground. About three feet away, I spotted the bottom of a Nike. I knew it had to be Mike's. I ran to the bush he was laying under. The sight I came upon still breaks my heart to this day. There was Mike, staring up at me with a terrified look on his face. Just under his arm was a hole with blood pouring out of it. It shocked me, but I did my best to play it cool. I didn't want to make him any more scared than he already was. Had I been older, I may have known better how to move him, but I just reached down and scooped him up in my arms. He was too heavy for me, but I was going to do my best to save him. I made it about a hundred yards before I had to set him down. He must have been in considerable pain. He asked me to leave him there and go get help. His voice sounded very weak, and I almost broke into tears right there. Somehow, I held myself together and ran another mile or so without stopping. Mom must have known something was wrong. She yelled out in a panicked voice for my father. My dad came out of the tent, took one look at me and said, How bad is it? I was too winded to speak. I just pointed him toward where I'd set him down and he took off. By the time I caught up, Dad was already picking him up and headed for camp. The entire ride to the hospital, Mom kept talking to him, telling him to hold on. I rode in the back seats, holding my shirt against the wound the whole way there. What would have normally been at least a 30-minute drive took us just under 20. Dad handed him off to the doctors. They had him in surgery within the hour, and the next three were a long, living nightmare. More shocked at what had happened to my brother, I was in amazement at how calmly my parents were handling everything. Having become a parent since, I realized they were far from calm, but they handled it well either way. It was after midnight when the doctor gave us the news. They had been touch and go for a long time. I only found out much later that Mike had died more than once during surgery, but Mike had a good chance of recovering completely. The police, having been notified of the shooting, arrived soon after dawn to question us. Now that the urgency of the situation had passed, I broke down several times during my recollection. That was the first time I came to grips with the possibility that I could have been shot myself. Mike was going to be in the hospital for a few weeks, so my parents got a hotel room nearby. I think my dad considered staying in the camp, but after a very short discussion with my mom, he decided against it. The detectives handling the case kept us up to date, but as late as the day Mike was discharged, no names have been connected to the case. The most widely held theory is that a poacher mistook the movement in the bushes for a deer and fired. It accounts for the red flags during the search through hunting licenses. It wasn't the first time this happened, and sadly won't be the last. Mike was one of the fortunate ones. Thirty-four years have passed since then, and nobody has been decisively connected to the shooting. Mike did make a full recovery and went on to start his own business and family, just like any other normal person. Oh, crap. Ray did actually come out of this mess. We never returned to the National Forest, and even better... Dad decided with all of those fat tourists with their RVs being around, it was a safer environment for he and his family. Between 12 and 17, I got to spend my holidays in awesome places like Yosemite and the Grand Canyon. This is the way I'd always thought camping should be, peaceful and quiet. And I'm almost positive Mike would agree with me. Fire starting, well, not hard for me. 
setting up the tent. I had purposely got the easiest tent I could find, yet it still took the better part of an hour before they had it up. The fire was already roaring by the time they joined me. I had buried potatoes in the coals, prepared the steaks to be cooked, and was well to my second beer by then. The steaks didn't take long, and by dark, we were sitting down to a delicious meal. After dinner, the real camping began. I had chosen to camp out in the middle of nowhere on purpose. I knew we'd become obnoxious and loud when we got drunk. And more importantly, I like to make big bonfires and turn my music up loud. You can't do that with others around you. That evening turned out to be a blast. We blew through two cases and didn't pass out until dawn. It was something I needed to do for a long time. And despite the hangover, I resolved then and there it was something we were going to do much more often. When I finally drugged myself from my sleeping bag, it was well past noon. Chuck and Glenn were already awake, sitting next to a cold fire. They both had a beer in their hand and looked happy to see me. I asked them what was up with the fire, and Chuck mumbled something about not being able to get it relit. This made me chuckle. I walked over to the tree line and grabbed an armful of wood. When I returned, I set it down on the dead coals and blew on to them. The coals lit up brightly, and the fire was roaring again within a few minutes. Then I went to the creek to fetch some water. The look on their faces was priceless. Chuck's jaw was hanging open, and I could tell Glenn was aching to ask me how I did it. While I waited for the water to boil, I cooked up a large mess of eggs and potatoes, and we ate breakfast with a cup of coffee. Once I had eaten, I was feeling much better and suggested that we go fishing. We didn't make it back to camp until almost dark. Unfortunately, no one had caught anything that we could keep, but I could tell Chuck had already caught a good buzz. I cooked what was left of the steak, and after, we set to finishing what was left of the beer. This evening was much tamer than the one before. I didn't want to make a big fire. It would only be harder for me to put it out completely before we left for home. Most of the night, the three of us talked about unimportant things like girls and work. Around two in the morning, we decided to turn in, the beer long being drunk. My last memory was Chuck going out to take a leak. He had drunk a lot more than Glenn or I. He fell several times trying to get out of his bag, but eventually made it out of the tent. I must have passed out just after that. The next thing I remember, the sun was already beginning to shine through the trees. I had to pee like crazy, so I fumbled my way to the zipper and tried not to wake the other two. As I unzipped the tent, a weird burning smell, similar to burned meat, hit me. I figured one or both of the guys were already up and burning our breakfast. I looked behind me, and only Glenn was still asleep. Chuck must have been the one cooking, and he was terrible at it. I crawled out with a smirk on my face and a smart remark for him. I looked up expecting to see my brother burning food, but was met with a sight far more serious and horrible than I could have ever imagined. The fire was burned out, and Chuck was nowhere to be seen. The dawn was still too dim to make out the large object laying across the dead coals. I walked up, within a few steps, and was hit fully by the burning smell. Then all of a sudden, it hit me what I was seeing. Chuck was lying face down across one corner of the cold fire, and he wasn't moving. Without a second thought, I grabbed his body and rolled it over. All I could see was black and smell of a terrible burning. I began yelling for Glenn, and when he didn't answer immediately, I ran into the tent and shook him. He was reluctant at first, but when I yelled that Chuck was freaking dead, loudly in his face, he jolted upright and asked me to repeat it. All I could do was point toward the remnants of the fire and the horrible vision that the sun was making clearer by the minute. He flew from the tent in one quick motion and came almost face to face with the charred body of our dead brother. I stood behind him, and silently with my eyes closed. Glenn fell to his knees and started wailing. At that second, I wanted to be anywhere but there. The sound of Glenn's haunting wails and the horrible smell permeating the air was worse than any nightmare. I'm going to go grab a telehandler. A cold breeze was blowing across me, and that was when I first realized that I had peed myself. It didn't matter, though. With every second, 
The sight became clearer, and I was too terrified to open my eyes. This was not the way I wanted to remember Chuck. I eventually crawled back into the tent and started crying myself. This continued for God knows how long, until I figured I should call 911 and let them know what had happened. They arrived about an hour and a half later. In the corner left with his body, I summed up the courage to come out. When I was speaking to one of the officers, the smell was still so bad, I began retching and retreating back to the tent. Soon after, another officer joined me inside the tent. We talked about the trips and events of the night before, nothing in particular. He left about 20 minutes later with the remaining officers. I began breaking down camp, and Glenn soon joined me. As we worked, nothing was said between us. I moved as fast as possible, hoping to soon be away from the terrible smell of my brother's burning flesh. Looking back on it now, I acknowledge that I may have looked a bit cold and uncaring. In my defense, I was the oldest and had the responsibility of notifying the rest of the family. I knew our mother was going to be crushed, and I wanted to tell her before she heard it from the news. When it comes to Glenn, I can't speak for how he was feeling or what he was thinking. No one has the right to dictate to another how to handle their grief, especially in a circumstance such as this. Telling Mom was as bad as I had imagined. She always wanted a large family. When Dad died, she thought her dream was over. However, when she met my stepfather and he mentioned adoption, she was overjoyed. Chuck and Glenn were actual brothers, about two years apart, and in their early teens when Mom found them. Boys their age are usually hard to adopt out, but Mom had fell in love with them at first sight. I always considered them my blood, as did the rest of my family. Glenn and I stayed close to her for some time, knowing how hard Chuck's loss was on her. This was the first instance I began to get the feeling Glenn harbored suspicion. Bro, I'm in the broadcast.